thank you for inviting me to talk to you tonight. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Rachel Brooks. I'm an artist and I'm going to be chatting to you tonight about ocean art and how that can be used as a tool in conservation. Um, so to introduce myself a little bit more, um, I work professionally as a wildlife artist and scientific illustrator. I'm based on the west coast of Scotland and Oban, which I'm sure a few of you are familiar with for diving. And my work mostly specializes in the ocean and marine life species, but I do work with terrestrial subjects as well and also in conservation based concepts, um, mostly known as artivism, which we'll explore a little bit more during this talk. Um, so my artwork has been largely influenced by other aspects of my life and career. Um, so as well as working as an artist, I do also work as a wildlife guide um, in the Sea of the Hebrides, based out of Oban as well. Um, so I'm also a scuba instructor and I do some scientific communication work alongside both my wildlife guiding work and my artwork as well. Um, and that largely stems from my background in zoology, which is what my degree was in. And that's why I'm particularly drawn to the field of scientific illustration as well. Uh, and I really enjoy finding creative ways to share new science and research um, with new audiences. So, um, go to the next one. I'll uh, put a disclaimer in that I don't think this is a very um, accurate map, <laughs> um, but it's a little look into my life in the dive industry. Um, so for the past eight years, I've worked as a scuba instructor. If we look at the top left to start with, um, that's me quite a long time ago in a pool in Sharm El Sheikh. And that's when I first learned to dive. I think that was back in 2009. Um, and it was not an instant hook for me, I will admit. Um, and I didn't dive when I came back home for quite some time after that. It was only on holidays. I was not quite hardcore enough to be jumping in the water in the Pennines when I was 15. Um, that came a little later in life. Um, but after uni, I graduated and I went to Australia to work. Um, and there I did a dive master traineeship, uh, a dive site called the Yongala. Uh, so that's the SS Yongala wreck, um, situated in far enough Queensland. And that was a real hook <laughs> back into diving for me. So, um, it's a really awesome dive site. It's situated in the Great Barrier Marine Park, and it's really well known for its really large pelagic life. Um, from there, I traveled over to the West Coast and did an instructor course over there. And after that stayed and worked for a couple of years teaching diving out of Perth. Uh, and again, that was a really different environment and um, more colder water. Uh, temperate reefs, a lot of kelp beds and some really cool life there as well. A lot of macro stuff like seahorses you'd see quite often. And then also some really cool big life like sea lions, sharks and rays too. Um, and then I pretty much exhausted every visa opportunity to stay in Australia at this point. Uh, so then headed over into Southeast Asia, firstly to Borneo. Um, in Sabah, uh, the Malaysian part of Borneo, where I worked as a scuba instructor for a little while on a tiny island called Mabul. Um, Mabul has some really awesome diving. Um, its sister next door is probably a bit more well known, so it's quite close to Sipadan. Uh, but in its own right, Mabul is a really great dive destination. Um, but being there and living out on those islands, uh, it was really sad to see the effects of plastic pollution there. There's some really awful sites uh, from dynamite fishing, and it was quite confronting to see some of those things. Um, it didn't take me long to then head back over to Oz, uh, where I worked with whale sharks and manta rays for a little while in the Ningaloo Reef, um, which was a really amazing place to live. Um, and then my very last 
stint overseas in the diving industry was in the Lembe Straits. Uh, so if we're looking at that little critter up in the top bubble, um, it's flamboyant cuttlefish. And uh, one of the many awesome things you can find over in Lembe. So all of these places have um, really influenced a lot of my work. And Lembe especially was where my passion for underwater photography really took off. So the diversity of things that you can see there um, is just phenomenal. Um, so then we're up to 2019, where I swapped the tropical shores of Indonesia for the tropical shores of the Hebrides um, and moved to Oban on the west coast of Scotland. So I work here um, with basking sharks as well as alongside working as an artist. Um, and this is one of my favourite spots uh, to snorkel in the UK, um, which on a really good day looks like this. Uh, so this is the Isle of Col, but much more frequently it looks a bit more like this. <laughs> so this is one of the main challenges of operating in the marine environment in Scotland, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. So bringing that back now to my art career, I still do spend a lot of time at sea. Um, but now I'm spending a lot more time in my studio um, and still introducing people to the underwater world, but through a different medium. So on the left hand side, you can see some of my scientific style illustrations. And this is what I mostly specialize in. Uh, this like classic old school zoological and um, field guide type of work. Uh, so it's got a really huge history in that industry and something I feel particularly connected to through my studies as well. And then I also work on some fine art pieces. You can see the other side, um, the Baskin Shark piece, which is still lying unfinished in my studio at the moment. Um, but over the past few years, I've become particularly recognised for my work with sharks, and that's a subject area that um, I've been really focusing on. And um, we'll come into a little bit more about why that is later. Um, but I started this professionally in 2020 after coming back from working full time in the dive industry. And in that time, here are some of the brands and organizations that I've worked with. Um, so I'm really proud to have been featured on some of these platforms. Some of them have been commercial clients of mine. Some of them have been um, media features, uh, such as the Discovery Channel. And that was a feature during the Shark Week last year. And it was a really awesome way to see that they're trying to display a new kind of content and not the typical uh, Shark Week style you'd expect. But they shared some of my um, processes of drawing sharks and picked out species like the Greenland shark and cat sharks and more uh, unusual species that don't quite get the airtime usually. So that was a really cool feature. Um, and then a lot of the others are from um, storytelling. So I've done interviews with a few of these companies about, again, shark conservation and how art can work alongside that, um, which is what we're going to be going into a bit more detail on. Um, so when it comes to my artistic process, I find the experiences that I've had um, in the field over the past few years have been really integral in developing my style and subjects. Um, finding that I've spent so much time with them in their environment has given me a, like a really great understanding of that them, their behavior, what they actually look like, how they move. Um, and I really enjoy drawing things from my experiences and things I've seen. Um, I think you're drawing things you are more passionate about. It always comes through better in the final result. Um, something I really enjoyed when teaching diving as well was being able to introduce people to new things and new species. Um, so I like to be able to showcase new and extraordinary things in my work as well and hopefully keep that going from the land. 
Um, and if we're thinking about extraordinary species, Lembe is a good place to look back to. And so these are a couple of my photos from Lembe. As I said, this was really when I first started a passion for underwater photography. I've always been a passionate photographer, never um, has taken over art in terms of turning hobbies into careers, but um, it's something I really enjoy doing. Um, and Lembe was a great place for macro photography, especially with the black volcanic sand flats that you get there. You get some really striking images, especially with the um, really colorful life and really quirky things you can find. So they've got mandarin fish just on our house reef there, and this uh, pinnate juvenile bat fish as well, which is a really beautiful subject. And then we are coming on to this one. Uh, so as a zoologist, this one I found uh, particularly intriguing because I did study this um, parasite at university. Uh, so if you look into the mouth of the anemone fish, you can see the tongue-eating isopod, and that pretty much does what it says on the tin. Um, and you see plenty of those in the Lembe Straits, um, which make a really patient testing <laughs> photo subject. Um, I entered this one into the Sony World Photography Awards back in 2020, and it was shortlisted in the open competition. And it was meant to be exhibited that year as well, but unfortunately, like many things in 2020, that didn't go ahead. Um, but I've not had much chance to do as much photography since I've come back to the UK, but I've been able to use some of these photos, inspiring some of my artworks and drawing them from reference to um so this is a piece um named ocean curiosities and again going back to the idea of introducing people to the less unknown things um as a diver i'm sure that you'll be a bit more familiar with these species than the general public are but i think it's still important to share some of the more weirder and wonderful things that are in the ocean and not just the pretty coral reef turtle shots that we see so much of. And there's so much more in the ocean and it's all equally fascinating. And having that fascination in something is really important in making people interested in it and wanting to understand more about it as well. And one of the things I find most interesting is octopus. Um, so these were one of the subjects that I love diving with the most i think they've got so much personality and they're so diverse and interesting as well they're just an incredible species and um, so both of these um, pieces really reflect that kind of blackwater diving that you can find there and the strikingness of the backgrounds so looking a little bit closer to home as well um the sea of the hebrides is a really special marine environment and uh, so I've been really lucky to spend three summers at sea here. And there's a huge amount of life to be found um, during the summer. We get these huge plankton blooms that just bring so much into the waters around the islands. So of course you've got your baskin sharks, but we also have huge numbers of common dolphins. We often see superpods here as well. We've also seen humpback whales and um, bubble net feeding off the coast this year and lunch feeding in the past too. And they seem to be making a comeback in UK waters, which is just incredible news. Um, and it's really awesome to be able to see life like this um, at home. So, so when it comes to talking about sharing the unknown and getting a general interest in those things, the marine life in the UK is largely in that category. Um, people don't seem to appreciate quite what we have here um, and I know I don't need to tell you guys that uh, but it's really important to remind others that we have all this incredible wildlife on our doorstep so um, again if people are not sure that these things are there then they're not worried about losing them in the first place so if we're talking about conservation raising awareness of how great our oceans are is just a really big thing in itself. Um, so there's this perception that 
the UK, the waters are just dark and lifeless and it's not the case at all. So this is just a handful of all the amazing things you can see off the coast here. And that doesn't include the macro life, uh, the bird life, the kelp, everything else in between. Um, we've got a really diverse and special environment. Um, and I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking seals are one of my favourite species to be in the water with here. Um, similar to the reason that I like diving with octopus. I think I like, they've got so much personality um, and they can be equally as interested in you as you are with them. So this seal is called Ariel. Uh, I've known her for two years and I can recognise her um, by her behaviour as well as her appearance. So we first met her in 2021 and she really stole the hearts of everyone um, on our trips because um, the seals here don't typically behave like they might in the Farne Islands or Lundy. They're not quite as used to seeing people. So we don't find that we get a lot of um, seal interactions where they're really seeking out um, interaction with you but more so just having a little look is what you'd usually find they're still very naturally curious but ariel was a bit of a superstar she really loved um interacting with people and the interactions that people had after having an experience with like that with a wild animal it was really special and um, so she's been featured i think by a lot of photographers now she was filmed with steve backshaw this summer uh, Bertie Gregory had her featured on National Geographic. Um, so yeah, she's a bit of a poser. Um, and here are some of my favourite shots of her. Um, and unfortunately, this is one of probably the saddest photos I've taken as well. So this was um, from during one of our swims. Um, she'd swam up on the surface and managed to swim through this plastic bag. And uh, it wrapped around her flipper. It did eventually come loose, but it was one of those moments where it kind of brings you back to reality. And it was really sad um, to see that in the environment that you typically see as quite a clean, pristine environment as well. Um, but uh, the waters here, especially around the Hebrides, they're quite remote and rough. You do get a lot of marine debris. And it is a really large um, problem here, especially with discarded fishing gear. Um, this is one of those kick yourself moments as well, where you want to take a photo so quickly that you don't get it in focus. But still, I think it's quite um, impactful to see. So my memories from diving have inspired me to create both beautiful things to share but I also think it's equally as important to tell the stories of the less beautiful side of the ocean as well. The real issues that our oceans are facing and those things are really visible to people who spend a lot of time in those environments. So that brings us on to the term artivism. So as you can see, it's a bit of a mix of words between art and activism. And it essentially means using art in a way to share these conservation issues. Um, it's a side of art I've been exploring since before I knew it had a name. Um, and I dedicated my college portfolio to portraying the loss of biodiversity across the world. And I'd love to go back and explore some of those pieces again. Now I've got a much more refined practice. Um, but this over here, the hourglass image is one of the first artivism pieces I shared uh, back in 2020. Um, and it's called the Anthropocene. And um, if you're not familiar with the term the Anthropocene, it's an unofficial epoch in time, referring to the time frame in which human activity has begun to negatively impact the planet. Um, and so looking through here, there's a clear theme of extinction in this piece. At the top, I um, wanted to keep a real celebration of biodiversity and try and include as many different environments um, as possible and make it really colourful 
Uh, again, trying to remind people of how special these things are. And then if we go to the bottom where the sand would be tipping out to, um, you can see that that color just disappears. And I wanted to make a really emotive piece with this. Um, and it's a topic that's difficult to talk about. Um, and that's why I wanted to portray it as a drawing. Um, I find communication when, of something I'm so passionate about to be quite difficult. Um, so drawing it is a much more um, easy way for me to express how I feel about something. So if you're looking into that, um, there's also an element of hope in that because if you're looking at an hourglass, it's something that can be turned and it doesn't mean that that's fixed. Um, there's still like a change that can happen there. Um, so one way of using art as a tool in conservation is in that sort of way. So directly featuring those subjects and those topics in your work, but it can also be less direct. And um, that's right, drawing people in to the stories and the background of your piece. And um, so this is John Coe and Aquarius. Some of you might be familiar with them. They are some more of our local celebrity wildlife here in Scotland. Uh, John Coe is the one with the notch in his fin, and he's probably one of the most well-known orca here. Um, his size is really, really big, and he's got very distinct features. Um, so he's often quite sought out between uh, avid whale watchers. So they have a really sad story, unfortunately, and it's one that I tell a lot whilst I'm working at sea here. And I find it really moves people. Um, as the fate of this orca pod is, again, quite a sad one. Uh, both of these orca are males, and they're thought to be the last two in the West Coast community. So this is a quite a unique orca ecotype and they're residents of the British Isles. Um, so different to the ones that you see up in Orkney and Shetland. Um, this, this pod is unfortunately classed as functionally extinct. Um, what seems to be happening is as they feed exclusively on marine mammals like porpoises and dolphins, they've accumulated a really large amount of toxins especially PCBs. So one of the females was washed ashore in Tyree back in 2016, and she could have well been the last female in the pod. So her name was Lulu. And, and when they did a necropsy on her, they found that she'd never been pregnant or given birth. And her tissues are so saturated in PCB toxins that at the time she was classed as the most polluted animal on record. And sadly, this has since been surpassed by another. So I really wanted to find a way to share this story. Um, orcas are a really enigmatic species. And the fact that we're losing them from our coast without many people being aware is really quite devastating. So this is the piece that I made. Um, it's a portrait of John Coe, if you like. Um, and it just uh, shares his connection with the environment here in the Hebrides. So within the body of the orca, you can see the Hebridean islands and all the other marine species that are connected through that environment. Um, I entered this piece into Sketch for Survival um, earlier last year. So out of over 3000 entries, it was selected um, in the top 15. Uh, so I was really pleased with that. Um, and with that, it meant it was exhibited in that uh, competition as well. So he toured the UK a little bit. He went to Norfolk, to Edinburgh, and then down to London, and also virtually to New York. Um, so I was really happy that he got to share his story a little bit in all of those places. And this has been one of my most popular pieces to date. Um, because I think people really connect with the background to it. And the original artwork was sold at auction uh, as part of the competition. And the whole uh, title was raising money for Explorers Against Extinction. And they raised over $60,000 in the art auction for this year. 
which is an incredible achievement. And all of that money goes towards supporting their nominated projects. So one of the other species from the Hebrides that I have a particular affinity to um, and wanted to showcase was the basking shark. Um, so my life for the past three years has revolved pretty much around basking sharks, talking about basking sharks, searching for them, answering questions about them, and on a good day, swimming with them too. Um, but outside of our little basking bubble, and um, these sharks are still relatively unknown, um, even to people within the UK. And um, there's been some really fascinating research about them released in the past year, highlighting the importance of these areas to this endangered shark species. So we know that the Sea of the Hebrides MPA, which has been established in the past few years, um, is presumed to be an important courtship place for the basking shark. So in a similar style to the orca piece, I created um, a second one in this sort of collection. Um, and this one's my biggest original drawing to date. Uh, so it's a A1 in size, and it was donated to the Shark Trust as part of the Oceanic 31 project. And um, when I was contacted by them earlier this year, asking to be part of it, we were given a list of 31 oceanic shark and ray species to choose from, which was really difficult for me because I wanted to draw all of them. But I thought this would be a good opportunity to celebrate Daskus. So it was launched um, in November at the Full of Sharks event, and the, all those pieces were exhibited at the Royal Geographic Society. So what's almost as tricky as getting a photo of a basking shark is taking a good photo of your artwork once it's framed. So having worked with basking sharks for three years, um, I've been in the water with them in all sorts of conditions, and many of them are not conduitive for good photography. So making this piece, one of the main challenges I had was the lack of reference material of the shark in the position that I wanted it. Um, so the most iconic thing about the basking shark, of course, is its ginormous mouth. Um, and if you look at a scientific illustration, usually it's the side profile and you kind of lose that element of identity. So I really wanted the shark curving back towards the camera, um, which in real life is very tricky to get because if you're swimming towards the mouth of the shark, the shark's just going to keep turning away from you. So I did build that concept up using lots of different reference photos uh, to try and get that angle that I wanted. So as I said, I do spend a lot of time talking about basking sharks, as I'm sure you've clocked by now. Um, so on the Sharkcast podcast, um, I've been co-hosting, we've been interviewing researchers about uh, basking shark science and also in the Whole Tooth podcast, which I've been honoured to now be a guest on twice, uh, the first time discussing basking sharks and their feeding behaviour and the second time was talking about how art can be used in shark conservation. So if you want to know more about basking sharks, do have a little look at those and give them a listen. And we also had my very fleeting television debut on the shark series with Steve Bakshaw. So, um, as we just mentioned, basking sharks are relatively unknown and I will admit that I didn't know about basking sharks until I left the UK and a diver overseas asked me about them and said, oh, you from the UK, have you swam with a basking shark? And I was mind blown that that was something you could do here. Um, so it's not surprising that a lot of the public are not aware of the shark life that we have in our waters. And it's a really great opportunity for the media to take advantage of that and jump in with their terror inducing headlines. And um, so this is a topic that gets me particularly angry. And something I'm working on is trying to show sharks in a positive light and try and attempt to change some public perceptions of them. 
If you look at the language used in these headlines, the negative um, connotations behind it, you've got families flee, menacing, lurking, stalking, terrifying. All of these headlines are about basking sharks. And I think we can agree that they don't do any of those things. Um, so engaging the public in a different outlook on sharks is really important because otherwise this is the only side of sharks that they're exposed to. Um, you've got the jaws effect as well. So you're scared of something. It's not the first thing that you want to protect. And sharks really need our help. Um, if you can be a positive voice for sharks and um, portraying them in the true light, uh, this creates another image for people to see. So this is what I try and do in my art, um, is try and focus on sharing positive um, images of sharks. This hammerhead piece was created in collaboration with a charity called Saving the Blue that are based in the Bahamas. They work with great hammerheads as well as some other species. Um, and similar to the orca, I wanted to show that sharks are connected to the environments and ecosystems that they inhabit. Um, playing a really crucial role there as apex predators. So their presence is really important and it's something not to be overlooked. In my scientific illustrations as well, I like to try and show the diversity of sharks because they're a really fascinating group of animals. Um, when I share those artworks, I create as much information as possible to go with them. Um, to try again to reach new audiences and educate people about these different species. Um, as well as sharing popular ones like the great white shark, um, I also try and feature more obscure species too, like the Greenland shark, um, which is equally as fascinating. So as well as shark conservation, a topic I'm really passionate about is plastic pollution. And as I lived in Indonesia and Malaysia, um, this is something like quite close to my heart. Um, this photo is taken in my bowl, and unfortunately, it's just not an isolated photo. Uh, this was an everyday kind of occurrence there. So it becomes a really huge problem. Um, again, these ones are from Indonesia. And seeing these things firsthand is quite confronting. And it does change how you behave and act as a consumer then on in your life, I think. And something I'm quite wary of running a business is my impact. And I try to use these um, examples and be a better consumer and pass that message on through my art too. Um, so I created this piece inspired by um, the plankton not plastic campaign that Baskin Short Scotland ran, um, where they did some really big offshore cleanups. Obviously, it's a really challenging environment to do that kind of operation. Um, it's not often you get weather conditions that allow you to take boats to places like that here. Um, but I really liked the concept behind the campaign. Um, and again, looking at our own British wildlife, um, this is not just a problem in faraway places like Asia, it's very much a problem here too. Um, so again, looking at artivism and how that can be used to share messaging. So last year, um, we had a group of artists, um, myself included, got together through Instagram and we created a campaign called for planet ocean um so for planet ocean was to encourage people to explore environmental art and um, with a series of prompts and the, all these pieces here from the co-hosts of the competition uh, so you can see there's loads of different art styles and artists involved and um, it was basically a creative call out um to give people ideas to create things that maybe they wouldn't usually use as a topic. And we looked at things like blue carbon, uh, clean seas to inspire people to look into those sort of things and share messaging and again, get those topics out to a much bigger audience. 
And getting really creative people together is a really great way to find novel ways to communicate things and for new ideas. And you'll see more and more charities are working alongside artists and calling out for competitions in similar sort of um, elements looking for conservation based art. Um, I'll admit that these artworks are not mine. <laughs> uh, so another charity that I worked alongside was the Pearl Protectors. They're um, based in Sri Lanka and that's another marine, um, marine organization. So these are a couple of their entrants into an art competition that I was judging. And you can see by their ages, nine and six, um, that these kids are so aware now of what is happening in the ocean around them, especially living on an island like Sri Lanka. It's like you're surrounded by some really beautiful marine life. Um, I don't know about you, but I found it very moving that that was made by a six year old because at six, I definitely was not that aware of um, these sort of issues. Um, but there's so much information and resources now at our fingertips and we've got so much opportunity to share um, freely on the Internet and on social media. But these tools are really powerful. Um, I use social media a lot, especially Instagram, um, as a way to share my work and communicate with a wider audience. And I found it to be a really great platform for that and to create a community of essentially like-minded people or people who are interested in the ocean and they're therefore likely to be interested in protecting it too. Um, I found that the pieces that I share that are educational are the ones that perform the best. And so whether that's uh, how I create art and art processes or snippets of scientific research. So something I'm trying to do at the moment is to break down scientific um, papers to make them more accessible and understandable to the general public. Um, people do want to learn. Uh, it's within us, I think, as humans we're naturally curious and people respond really well and um, when they can see a human element behind something so if you can tell a story behind something uh, it gives it just that little bit something extra that they connect to uh, so this i thought was some really fascinating research that's been going on in south africa um the great white sharks especially in um areas that they were so famously seen in the past are starting to move out of those areas because the orca have been specializing on hunting them in an insane technique. Um, so there's two orca named Port and Starboard and they have learned that if they flip sharks on their back it puts sharks into tonic immobility and that gives them the chance to remove the liver of the shark and that's all that they will take. Um, and they've become so successful at doing this that they've managed to drive the great white shark population pretty much out of its range. Um, the tagging data from it shows that some sharks leave the bay for up to a year after there's been an orca predation. So it's having a really huge effect on the environment there. Um, with that gap in the ecosystem of that top predator, um, things have just become completely out of whack. And it's interesting to see how much the other life that's affected. So the reduction in number of sharks has increased the number of Cape fur seals. And with that, they're finding that they are predating more on the African penguin population, which are endangered and only found in that area. So these um, little snippets, I think are a great way to get people engaged in science that they might not typically be reading. Um, but it's really interesting uh, stuff. And again, this is what I find my audience is most engaged with. And so it's a great way to connect with people. And um, in that as well, I would do like to share some positive news. Um, talking about conservation can be a little bit doom and gloom. 
Um, but here's just some of the great things that happened in the past year for the ocean. So if you were following what happened at CITES, um, it was monumental um, for shark conservation. Um, leaders voted to list all the proposed species under Appendix 2, which means now that the trade in those species is going to be really regulated for the first time. And that was over 90 species of shark, um, which will have huge impacts on the shark fin trade going forward. In the same um, leg of that, the US has just announced a bill which will ban the fin trade there. So buying and selling of fins will now be illegal if that all goes through. Again, all going towards big steps in shark conservation. And back to the Baskin shark. Uh, so Baskin sharks were granted historic protection in Ireland this year. And that was something that was given to them here in the 1990s. So this has been a very long time coming. And um, if you had seen the videos from Ireland in the last couple of years with huge aggregations of Baskin sharks creating these big um, tornado um, effects, they're called Taurusin. And it's fascinating what's going on there. And um, it's a big shark courtship circle, essentially. Um, and they've dubbed it as speed dating for basking sharks. So that area up until last year was not protected. And um, so now it is now illegal to disturb or harass sharks in those places, which is really important in their protection. So I, as we've spoken a little bit again about conservation, I didn't want it to be all uh, doom and gloom. There is so much you can do um, with art as a tool, and that's all applicable to photography as well. Um, so I'm hoping that you found some of that interesting and inspiring. And um, yeah, thank you for listening to me <laughs> and having me on to chat to you tonight. And um, if you'd like to see any more of my work, uh, this is where you can find me online, uh, just by searching Rachel Brooks Art into pretty much any platform. So thank you.